Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are and how you have revealed yourself to each one of us so that we have enough of the mind of Christ to come into your house to hear what you're saying. So give us ears to hear and give us a heart to receive because it is our desire to please you. It is our desire to know more about you so that we can honor you with our whole life. I humble myself before your righteousness right hand, Father, and I thank you for putting your word in my mouth and for covering me with the shadow of your hand. I thank you that it is not human wisdom on display, but it is a demonstration of your Holy Spirit's power, that men's faith would not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of you, the Almighty God. And so we commit the lesson to you in Jesus' name, trusting for you to be glorified through your Son. In Jesus' name, all the believers said... Amen. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we began a series uh, and then we closed it with a focus on how God uses regular and ordinary people. Interestingly enough, it is through two regular people, one Mary and the other Joseph, in a less than ordinary setting, a barn that we now call a manger, that we as Christians have begun a season where we celebrate the entrance of the extra ordinary, the extraordinary work of God. That is Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God announced to the world. His name, Emmanuel, God with us. A baby born in a broken world to establish the kingdom of God born so that he might deliver and completely save all of God's affection, the object of his affection, born to demonstrate obedience even unto death, born to destroy the power of darkness that oppressed humanity, born of a woman, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The image of the invisible God finally revealed. And when the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Son of David did appear just as the prophets foretold, well, the Bible says that the angels began to sing. That the magi, that is the priests, they brought their gifts from afar so that they might worship and the world would tell the story, the story of her Christ. It is the story that changes man's reality, the story that actually gives meaning to this life. It is the story that does offend, but it also penetrates the hardest of hearts and saves the most vile of man along with the most noble. It is an incomparable story of truth and justice, grace and mercy, compassion and kindness. It is the story of love. Love. Nothing foreign about love. We all want to be in love. We all want to love. We don't mind love. When we think about love stories in movie form or in book form or songs, we like love. If I say, who's your favorite artist? People will say, John Legend, of course, he sings love songs. If somebody asks you, what's your favorite song? Perfect by Ed Sheeran. I like love songs. Some of you say, I don't know any of those people, but I know the temptations. I guess you'll say, what can make me? All oh, my Motowners right there. <laughs> we like love, right? We like 
love. We appreciate love. I believe that we like love because it actually depicts for us an intriguing interest from one party to the other. It shows us a mounting suspense, a trust without any guarantee of voluntary risk, an acceptance despite weaknesses that are seen. It shows us selfless commitment, love. Love makes for beautiful songs, beautiful storylines, but I'll tell you this, that the divine love story outweighs any book that you've read, it outweighs any movie you've seen, any song that you've swooned by, any experience that you personally had, because the divine love story is about the living hope. That before there was a manger and any magi, Isaiah would pronounce to the world, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And so from Genesis through Revelation, this, this living hope means that he is relevant as the true and the living God, as the bishop and the overseer of our life, as the chief shepherd of our future, as the guide for our steps, as the friend that sticks closer than a brother, as Isaiah calls him, our husbandman. He is is the living hope. The divine love story is about the living hope, but it is also about a fulfilled promise. A fulfilled promise that Matthew says that she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Promise given and Revelation 3 shows us promise fulfilled. As he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone should hear my voice and open the door, open the door of your life, open the door of your ways, open the door of your heart. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, for I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Because the promise is fulfilled, then God will make himself known to us individually, individually with a sweet fellowship. It is an intimacy with God that's available to each believer, and if you will pursue the divine love story. The divine love story is about a living hope. It is about a fulfilled promise, and it is a story that causes a happily ever after. See, Jesus tells us in John that he who believes in me has everlasting life. And so this love story goes beyond the flesh. This love story will never end. In fact, this love story will cause our path to be brighter and brighter until the full light of day. This love story completes you and is good for you. This is a love story that is like no other love story. This is a love story story that is forever, where the bride of Christ daily makes herself ready for her Savior. We ready ourselves then through the 66 books and letters of our Bible, where our Father not only introduces himself to us, but he also tells us that we are his own. He tells of his desire for each one of us individually, a desire that he would have 
all of us, not just one part, not just every other now and again. No, but he would have every part of our being and that he would give every part of himself to you. And so throughout the scriptures, he tells us about relationship. Relationship where he sees you, where he secures you, and where he has saved you. Saved you based upon, number one, truth and justice. There in 1 John chapter 4, let's look at it in verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he, what? Loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. In other words, to be the substitute for our sins. You see, within any love story, there is a dance between two people. You know, a visible display of preference, uh, the beauty of being chosen and preferred, of being seen, of being noticed by someone. Love stories, they idealize a basic human desire to be wanted, to be wanted and needed. And the birth of Jesus is the story of love because it points to God's calculated and willful desire for you. You are why Jesus came, because the Father saw you. And there is nothing about who you are that was or is hidden from your God. And yet, he still wants you. He still wants relationship with you. And so he offers to you Jesus. Jesus who comes on the scene introducing himself in John 14 as the way, the truth, and the life. Our Father, he offers to us Jesus. Jesus, or it's being said in Acts chapter 4 that there is only one name under heaven whereby man can be saved. The name of Jesus. And so we see here that Jesus is the way. But we're also told that he is the truth. That he is the truth to your question. Your questions of who really loves me? Who's really for me? Who really gets me? Who wants me? Who's got me? Who? See, the Father sees you. He hears the cry of your heart and he answers. Understand the sin, the sin that kept you out of God's reach because he is holy has now been covered by Jesus, who is the propitiation, the substitute for your sin, meaning that God's perfect justice his perfect justice demanded the judgment of sin, which is death. His perfect justice demanded death. But Jesus, Jesus took the penalty of death for you. In other words, Jesus answers your questions by bearing the wrath of God for you. So who loves you? When the word put on flesh, he was saying, I do. Who's got you when Jesus lived perfectly before the Father, even when temptation came, he was saying, I got you. Who's for you when innocence got on the cross to die for your guilt, he was saying, I am for you. Who wants you when Jesus took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, he was saying, I do. I want you. I have loved you with an everlasting love and it will never stop, never change, never end. It lasts forever and ever and ever. 
My love has been proven through truth and justice, a sacrifice so great that it has provided forgiveness, it has provided reconciliation, it has provided restoration, it has provided peace with God. And so when you hear the foolishness of this world say, who going to check me, boo? He's going to check you, boo, because it is still the Christmas story, the story of love. It is the story of our Christ. It is an incomparable story of truth and justice. The story of number two, grace and mercy. We look now at Ephesians chapter two. It says in verse four, but God, but God who is what? Rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his what? grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In other words, he secures you. You're safe in him. You can trust him because he's stable. He won't switch up on you. You don't have to be tentative with him. You don't have to second guess yourself with him. You don't have to live in fear or anxiety with him. You don't have to wonder if he's going to change. Because he will not change Old Testament, Malachi, New Testament, Hebrews. He says, I am the Lord thy God, I changeth not. And there are so many people that we'd like to trust like that. We'd like to trust them. So many relationships that we'd like to know are safe like that. But the reality is situations change, facts change, people change change. We change our mind all the time. That's why he said, do not put your trust in man who has but breath in his nostrils. Of what account is he? And so sometimes it is without warning. Sometimes you can see it coming. Sometimes you just live in constant wonder. But let me assure you of this one thing. God is not fickle. People are, but God is not. He does not change his mind concerning you or your life. His love remains. And his faithfulness, his reliability, integrity, it's all central to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It cannot change because everything rests upon the gospel. And so he accepts you, not because of anything that you have done or will do or have not done at all, but because of love alone. And so you are greater than what you do. You're more valuable than what you own, and you are more important than your triumphs or your failures. Because listen, life in Christ is not about your adequacy or your sufficiency. Life in Christ is about your sincerity or your security in his grace and in his mercy. Your life is based upon your security in his grace and in his mercy. Grace that gives you access to the living God. Grace which gives you the privilege to call him your own. Grace, it gives you the blessing wherever you go. Grace, it gives you access to the benefits without any condemnation. Grace gives you an escape even when you're tempted. Grace allows you to get back up when you fall. And grace says you are still accepted, still loved, and that you still belong to the Father. Grace is possible because of his great love, because he is rich in mercy. See, he, he could have. He could have left us dead in our sin, 
but mercy. Mercy made a promise and kept a promise. He could have. He could have left us blind to the truth, but mercy introduced a baby in a manger. He could have judged us alone, but mercy increased this baby in wisdom and stature. He could have remained in wrath towards us, but mercy revealed a savior to us. He could have dominated you and made you do what he wanted, but mercy gave you a choice. He could have remained silent and distant, but mercy Mercy drew you so it stirred within you and awakening came upon you. He could have, but mercy because of his great love for us. The father who is rich in mercy made you alive together with him. He raised you up together and made you sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And with your new status, you are secure, safe and secure from all alarm. He won't forget you, abandon you, dismiss you. You're not an orphan. You're not an outsider, an imposter, but his love makes you accepted even if everything and everyone falls away. And so I pray like Paul prayed for the Ephesian church there in Ephesians 3, that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within you as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to feel and understand, as all God's children should, how long, how wide, how deep, and how high his love really is. And to experience this love for yourselves. We have an incomparable story a matchless story, one without equal, totally different in nature and extent, a love from the Father that affords us truth and justice, grace and mercy, as well as, number three, compassion and kindness. We look now to Mark chapter 6, where we read, But the multitudes, they, they saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with what? Compassion for them. Because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. If we look at Corinthians, we're told that we belong to the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, meaning not only does God see you, not only does he secure you, but he also saves you. He does save. And throughout the New Testament, we read how Jesus demonstrated compassion. We look at John, we're told about how Lazarus died. His sisters were in complete dismay, saddened by what happened. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus arrived, that he groaned in his spirit. In other words, there was compassion because he then wept. And after he would weep, he would raise Lazarus from the dead. Compassion. Matthew 20 tells us that Jesus had compassion. He had compassion and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Compassion. If we look at Luke, we talk about the woman or see the woman or the widow of Nain. She was without her husband, and now her son died. She's in a procession to bury her only child. Jesus is there, and compassion comes, and he raises her son from the dead. Compassion. 
If we look back at Mark chapter 6, Jesus saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion because they were people who were wandering, wandering as sheep without a shepherd, no protection, no defense, just wandering. And so he began to teach in response, compassion. His compassion, in other words, always seems to save a person from their plight, from death, from blindness, from this wandering. But now we must look at his kindness. His kindness is found in Romans chapter 2. We look at verse 4, the NIV says, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? And so from his compassion, he makes known who he is with a response towards us to save, remember, healing, miracles, and teaching. But Romans points to how his kindness is supposed to draw out a response from us from each one of us. And so if we look specifically back at the Mark passage, Jesus has compassion and saves them from their wandering by teaching them. And I believe the same is necessary for today. See, the account of Jesus is told year by year every December 25th, but for many, the story has become commercialized. So commercialized, all we think about are the lights and the tree, how I got to get to the mall. We have wandered away from love. There is no mutual dance, no preference towards God. For others, the story is supplanted completely by stress, by the pressure to spend. Do I have enough money? I need more money. I've got to put this under the tree. I've got to make sure that person has and the other, which then leads to this thing called strife and animosity and contention. It causes us to wander to wander from love. And then still others of us are so distracted that busyness has prohibited an authentic relationship with our Father. We have wandered away from love. Well, today I call us to respond to his kindness, that in knowing that he has compassion for each one of us and saves, that we would choose to respond with repentance. Repentance for wandering away without grumbling and complaining. This is all I got. For wandering away from complaining. If she thinks I'm going to get her that, she must be kidding. For wandering away from comparing ourselves to others. Well, if you're going to do that for your kid, then I must do that for mine. For wandering away with our covetousness, I wish I could have that. For wandering away with our distractions, we can't even think about God right now. For wandering away with stress and worry and pressure of the world to prove something. Jeremiah says it like this, chapter 50, my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Oh, there is a resting place in him, and it comes through repentance. And so I say, as your shepherd, you will not be lost at a mountain or on a hill on my watch. Not on my watch. I remind us of the resting place, the saving power of Jesus Christ, the love of God that seeks and saves every person that's lost, every person that's wandering. His compassion and his kindness remember where he saves and we respond. And so I pray, 
I pray, Father, that you would search each one of us and know our heart, that you would try each one of us and know our anxieties and lead us in the way everlasting. I pray, Father, just as Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and you would give us rest. We want to come to the resting place today. We take your yoke, Jesus, upon us, and we choose to learn from you. you you who are gentle and lowly in heart, that we may find rest for our soul, that we would not worry like the Gentile, but in the same way that you provide food and shelter, we don't have to worry about what we'll put on according to what is written. Let it be so in this house that we are worshipers and we recognize you as our provider entering into your rest. And so with 10 days left until Christmas, I encourage you to repent and ensure that Christmas this year is truly about the love of the Father, the divine love story, and that your response to the divine love story, that your response to the Savior is to love. Because of love, we are saved. It's to love. It's to love God with all of our heart, all of our strength, all of our mind. It's to love our neighbor as ourself. That when we think about this Christmas, we think about the divine love story. Every head bowed, every eye closed. <laughs>